Okay, good morning, everybody. Oh, look at that. That's a good picture. Okay, we are, do we have anyone online today? No one online today. No, Phyllis is there. Phyllis is there. That's good. She came to the early service. So here we are. This is the last week of Behind the Curtain. Uh, we kicked off our Sunday Adult Formation a couple of weeks ago, and we offered these series of presentations to get you understanding what happens at uh, Trinity by the Cove throughout the week um, and what it takes to um, engage in outreach, what it uh, means to engage in pastoral care um, and formation, and for today, uh, worship and music. So what does it mean to see behind the curtain? It's an idiom, and it means to gain an insight into how something works or operates beyond what is normally presented to outsiders inside baseball on church work. Um, so today is worship and music, and it doesn't take any, any effort to put on worship here at Journey by the Cove. I mentioned to you all the vision statement of the church, how Training by the Cove for the next 20 years wants to continue our excellence in worship um, and commitment to pastoral care and to work toward becoming a leader within the Episcopal Church in formation that develops strong and faithful Christians willing to assume responsibilities at all levels of society, spreading the good news of the gospel and offering care and compassion to people in need. Um, so in each of these presentations, we hit on a part of that vision statement. And for today, that excellence in worship. Now, worship is a word that's been passed down since the 13th century. Um, it's condition of being worthy, dignity, glory, distinction, honor, renown. So we honor and love God through worship. In the words of the prayer book, in worship, we unite ourselves with others to acknowledge the holiness of God to hear God's word, to offer prayer, and celebrate the sacrament. So let me read that again from the prayer book. Um, we unite ourselves with others. It's not just about us when we come to church. Um, we acknowledge the holiness of God. We hear God's word. We offer prayer, and we celebrate the sacraments. So take a moment and think, how do we worship? How do we worship? In worship, we unite ourselves with others to acknowledge the holiness of God, to hear God's word, to offer prayer, and to celebrate the sacraments. What has worship looked like? What has worship felt like throughout your life? Take a moment and think back. And now think about how we worship. In worship, we unite ourselves with others. We acknowledge the holiness of God. We hear God's word. We offer prayer and celebrate the sacraments. Another image of worship. Doesn't always have to be in church. It can be on the waterfront. So what's behind the curtain? Uh, we could start in a couple of different places, going through history and the human response to God, um, but let's jump past a whole lot of that and start with the Book of Common Prayer. Um, we're in an Episcopal church, and that means we find our unity in our bishop and in our common worship. The Episcopal Dictionary of the church notes that Anglican liturgical piety has been rooted in the prayer book tradition since the publication of the first English prayer book in, anyone? Ah, 1549. We who are many and diverse, we who are many and diverse, come together in Christ through our worship in our common prayer. The prayer book most recently revived in, revised in 1979, contains our, I was born by then, contains our liturgies, our prayers, our theological documents, and much, much more. Uh, even though you have bulletin eat, eats each and every Sunday, everything in that bulletin comes straight from the prayer book. So these are the prayers we offer, um, the work we do to draw our hearts closer to God so that we, we might find grace and solace, so that we might be strengthened for our callings to grow God's kingdom. 
So if we have these wonderful prayer books in the pew that are looking at you every single Sunday, the red ones, why in the world would we use bulletins when we have the great prayer book? Um, and we do spend a significant part of staff time and energy creating those bulletins each and every Sunday. But remember that in worship, we unite ourselves with others. We unite ourselves with others to acknowledge the holiness of God, to hear God's word, to offer prayer, and celebrate the sacrament. So we use bulletins to get on the same page with everyone else in the church. Those who have been Episcopalians their whole lives um, and basically have the service memorized to those who might be experiencing the Episcopal Church for the first time. I mean, it also keeps the priest on track. So in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in any Sunday, we celebrate a right one, a right two, and are we getting the these and the thous right? So we need our bulletin to make sure we're on the same page with you. Um, perhaps more simply said, um, bulletins are visitor friendly. We want to grow the church. We want to engage with people. Um, we want to make their worship with us a wonderful experience, and a bulletin uh, helps accomplish that. Um, they also allow us to be more clear about rubrics like standing and kneeling so that they were, we're worshiping in unity. And you've seen how some people express their independence, right? They want to stand when everybody else kneels. Um, and you, we had one recently. It was an Episcopal priest, retired Episcopal priest out in Colorado. So even though the rubric said kneel, he knows that in the prayer book it says stand or kneel. And so he wanted to stand. So there he is, three pews from the front, standing while everybody else is kneeling. Now, is that worshiping with others? Oh, I don't know. Who makes the decisions? So the prayer book has all sorts of options. Write one or write two. Those are the these and nows versus you. And within write one and write two, there are other options about the Eucharistic prayer and other prayers that are included. Remember that according to the canons of the church, it's the rector who has spiritual jurisdiction. Uh, so it's me who makes the final decisions about which options we choose on Sundays. And I bet some of you have stories about what the rectors of other churches you've been to do and what they don't do. Um, but I've said in previous forums that uh, the way I look at uh, this responsibility is that the rector sets the tone. So one of my beliefs is that priests can do a whole lot to get in the way of good worship. So I stick with the prayer book, and then we honor the history and piety of this place and its people. So, you know, what's a little bit about the history of this place and its piety? We're definitely not this, right? Smells and bells. So remembering back to worship, its definition, it involves worth, dignity, glory, distinction, honor, renown. Um, so, you know, how do we offer distinction to worship to God? Well, in a basic sense, we just adorn it. We dress it up. So the more distinction we place on the Eucharist, the more we adorn it with incense, with bells that are rung, um, as the bread and the wine are consecrated, with genuflecting and bows. You can see how that's adorning worship. Um, remember, too, that fights have been fought about adornments since the Reformation and even before. Um, continuing on down to today, when people criticize worship for being too adorned or too simple. Um, there are some denominations who don't even use musical instruments in their worship. It can only be the human voice. In the broadest sense, in these disagreements, all parties do look to Scripture. Does scripture allow something or does it promote it or not? And then the fight begins. For us as Episcopalians in the modern age, um, I have a hunch that disagreements are less based on scripture and more about personal preference. What makes me feel good in worship? What makes me feel comfortable? And then fight about it. Um, we experience this personal preference in a range of expression in the Episcopal Church from uh, two phrases and groups, Anglo-Catholic to Evangelical. Anglo-Catholics are going to adorn worship and sacraments, placing a huge emphasis on them, while Evangelicals will tilt more to the liturgy of the Word and Scripture. 
long sermons versus long musical anthems with incense. So Trinity has a really a low church background, morning prayer parish, um, so less emphasis on the Eucharist, uh, more on uh, prayer, morning prayer. But you've had rectors who are high church. And remember, the rectors set the tone. Um, so right now in our history, we are very much focused on the Eucharist. We adorn it with music, with bowing. And that's why some of the priests chant. Priests are only allowed to chant if they sound better than me. So that's the deal. Um, but we don't take the next step in adorning um, the Eucharist. We don't genuflect. We don't have incense. Uh, we don't have sanctus bells. Um, so that's how we sort of express ourselves right now in worship. Um, but let's get a little bit more specific about how we adorn uh, the services. So although final authority over music used in an Episcopal service is the duty of every minister, so the priest is in charge of music, our hymnal draws all Episcopalians together musically in the same way the Book of Common Prayer draws us together in prayer and liturgy. Most recently, the hymnal was revised in... 1982, um, offers 720 hymns in addition to liturgical music. While some of the hymns date back to monastic chants, the hymnal offers more modern music as well. So how do we select the music at this church? I mentioned that I have the ultimate authority, but I delegate it to someone much more capable. Tripp, come on up and give us a behind the scenes view. Do I have to switch the sides? Let me just see. No. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here and chat with you a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes here. So um, at Trinity, as Edward has mentioned, we have a lot of different services, and each one takes on a slightly different sort of flavor in terms of how much or how little and the, the, the degree and character of the music we use. So right one, the 730 service is the probably the least musically adorned. We allow the prayer book language of the older these and thou's to sort of come through. Organ music's just there to cover liturgical events, that being setting the altar at the offertory and then communion. And then we do sing one verse of a hymn just to, because Edward likes us to do some, some sort of singing. So we have our right two services at 9 and 11, 15. These are our principal liturgies with choir hymns and sung service music. It's predominantly traditional service music and hymnody, right? We don't have a lot of gospel tunes or folk music. Um, but that being said, we, um, you know, we can take, or no, actually, sorry, got ahead of myself in the notes. Now we're on to right three. So right three, if you've experienced it, is definitely our most diverse musical service. And in the prayer book, uh, the actual term right three is in the very back. And it basically gives you uh, free reign to do what you wish provided there's just a there's maybe a handful of benchmarks that you must have for it to be a, a viable eucharist but really uh it's uh it's uh choose your own adventure so in right three we have all kinds of um music from faith backgrounds and sources um often rarely from the episcopal tradition um, but that being said the episcopal church has authorized a few different supplemental hymnals beyond the 1982 hymnal um, that um, Right Three will often use. One of them is um, a hymnal called Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is a collection of spirituals. Um, other things, um, another one, the primary supplement is called Wonder, Love, and Praise. That has some more sort of folk shape note type of things. Um, we have, you know, Baptist hymns, folk melodies. Um, this service is really... Um, Betty personally would be a better person to talk to about how how all this happens because it is really under her great care and leadership that that service comes to be. Let's see, are we on the next slide yet? Ooh, there's some nice uh, fancy, hang on. What are we doing? Oh, we're not there yet. Okay, sorry. You give me a thing to fidget with and you know, it's all it's all off the table. So then we have Evensong, a service that we've started up a few years ago at, at Trinity. This is an, an ancient service straight out of the prayer book, and its roots come from the combination of the monastic uh, services of Vespers and Compline, the service of the hours in the old monastic tradition. The service is entirely sung, except for the two scripture readings, the Apostles' Creed, and the closing prayer. And the main highlight 
from a musical perspective, is a choral setting of the Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis canticles, which are the two canticles, even on the Song of Mary and the Song of Simeon. And composers have been setting these words to music for, I don't know, 500 years, Renaissance to present day. It's in, in over in England in cathedral life, you know, new new settings of Mag and Nunc are being written all the time. And it's uh, very, um, it's, it's a big part of a composer of church music's output. Then we have weddings and funerals. You know, these are really, um, I'm there more to guide and curate than to make selections. You know, every every individual has different um, different songs or pieces that mean things to them. And also you have some some people that are just, especially in, you know, a funeral, if they're where they are in their grief process, they're just not able to make any choices. And then at that point, I can take a little bit more of a lead. But for the most part, um, that's more of a listening experience. So then how do we select the music for each of these services? So the highest ranking criterion for me and for most is the lectionary. So obviously we want the anthems and the hymns to match with the readings. You know, we're not going to do a Christmas hymn in the middle of July, for example. That would be a little out of place. And then um, no comment. No comment. Anyways, uh, so there are, and then of course there are resources available where people have done some of the dirty work, so I don't have to, you know, do too much planning. They have the lists of the hymns and things. And then balancing, you know, a question I get all the time is how do you balance the new with the old? There are some congregations, luckily this is not one of them, but if there's a new hymn on a Sunday, there's a line of people waiting to talk to the organist after the postlude to wag their finger and say, hey, you shouldn't have done that. That was a bad idea. But, you know, it's it's really important that we expand our congregational knowledge of hymnody because, like Edward said, the hymnal is, you know, as as much of a comprehensive theological resource as the prayer book. So to only sing parts of the hymnal is not embracing the fullness of our wonderful worship and music tradition. Um, there are certainly, you know, tips and tricks where, you know, you don't do four new hymns on a Sunday, you do one new hymn on a Sunday or, um, but in general, or do a new text to a, a familiar tune. So it, it technically is a new hymn, but nobody would know because they're familiar with the tune. Anthems, again, lectionary based when possible, but a lot of times that's not, there's not always a specific anthem for every single scripture. So then, you know, that you get into more seasonal things like Advent and Christmas, a lot of the anthems are more generic, but that's okay. And then we also, um, our service music, those are the Sanctus and the Fractional Anthem that we sing, the 9, the 11, 15 services, those, um, those change seasonally. So, and then we, we kind of try to match. So Lent service music is less adorned, more simple. Easter is big and loud with uh, triumphant. The Sanctus we've done the last Easter had a big soprano descan at the end of it. Just ways to, um, we want to mirror the overall um character of each season with the music we don't want suddenly suddenly something to be thrown out of place seasonal selection what has worked and what are we learning about well that would be i i think i mean we have definitely introduced some newer things and for what from my perspective at the organ bench you know i can hear that there's gradually you know incremental increase in participation each week and that's, you know, or for example, like the, well, the fraction anthem we did today, the disciples, even if pe people at least are catching on and singing the refrain, which is great. Um, you know, nobody's going to give you a singing exam at the end of this. So, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, take risks, whether you, uh, um, whether you read music or don't. Let's see. And then the choir and musicians, we have a wonderful tradition of having a professional choir at this church. Um and, uh, you know, I came in here at a time when we were still in the middle of COVID and I wasn't able to hire anybody. And um, but I was still, you know, searching and kind of being ready to, you know, step on the gas once we got the all clear. Um, we rehearse um, once a week on Thursday nights. Um, and then we also will rehearse between the services. Betty is is putting them through the ringer right now while I'm here talking to you. So it definitely does not just show up and happen on Sundays. It's uh, this this church, especially now with the addition of Evensong, we the the choral program that we offer here is unsurpassed 
certainly in Southwest Florida and throughout the state. I mean, if you are a choir student, if you think particularly of our students that we have from FGCU, they come here and, you know, and they're in their college choir setting, they take a semester or a year and they rehearse the same, you know, eight to 12 pieces and they do it on a concert. They have all this time to polish here. You get one, sometimes just one rehearsal and then you're singing an even song with everything is sung except for a few things. And so that sort of, experience and the musicianship required to do that is really something that I hope that young people will see because, um, you know, as you know, my girlfriend, Kate, she grew up in this tradition and she says that, you know, her, her singing at a church gave her as much musical musicians, real world musicianship skills as her college degree did. So um, I'm very thankful that we are able to offer that and to give these opportunities to um, to some of the young people, while, of course, uh, having great uh, gratitude for some of our members that have been here uh, longer than, well, I guess, well, I won't say, when Marion was here, she was here longer than I've been alive, but she's off to wonderful, sunny retirement. Um, so that is pretty much music. Does anyone have any questions real quick? Am I allowed to open the floor? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. So the question was, uh, the choir is such an integral and beloved part of this congregation, but we don't know who they are. So she said, you know, maybe do like a little write up in the Trinitarian about some of the choir members. I think that's a great idea. Um, I have, tried, you know, it's difficult Sure. Or would you, or, or do we, do we want one at a time or do we want a full, full photo directory in one article? All right. The rector has been overruled. One at a time is the answer. It'll be a Trinitarian series. Yeah, Connie. They are shy until you put food in front of them. The question or the comment was, um, pray, eat, grow is a wonderful opportunity because oftentimes you will find yourself seated at dinner with these choir members and you can get to know them. Jenny or Ginny, sorry. Deb, it's one, I, I got it eventually. You're all sitting together. Uh, the, the question was, um, my, yeah, my, how in my training before getting hired, how knowledgeable of the intricacies of the Episcopal church was I, um, well, I can certainly say that this was not a part of my degree program, but I was very fortunate that I was the assistant at two Episcopal churches before I came here. Um, so between, I started when I was in grad school, so I had nine years of working in an Episcopal church. So by that time, I, I, yes, I was pretty much, I knew the ropes and I, I was, I was, trust me, I was more than ready to, to, to have my own shot, to, to sit in the big chair. Um, but yeah, that's a good question though. Anyone else? All righty. Thank you all. What's my favorite hymn? 57. Lo, he comes, lo, he comes with clouds descending. Advent. Stay tuned. We'll sing it. You know, it, it reminds me, I, the past couple of uh, weeks, I've uh, tried to describe the curacy program and how priests come and grow and learn. Um, and same can be said for the choir program with all of those students. So, you know, even though the uh, product that you all see every Sunday is uh, pretty spectacular, everybody's learning and growing as we go. 
So preaching is part of the worship service too. How does this work at Trinity? Well, uh, we have all the clergy on a rotation. Um, and as I've said, every clergy person who comes on staff, they actually have to go through and create the rotation. And then it shows up on my desk. So right now, Amy has been doing the rotation. And so she puts in who's going to preach, who's going to celebrate, who's going to assist at each and every service. And then I come and look at it and I say, no, 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 no. I don't really do that. She does a great job. But the 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 key here is having each different service experience each priest in a nice balanced way, so that um so that you all get to experience uh, the diversity of preaching that we have. Um, and at a multi clergy uh, staff, it is neat because you have uh, different people, uh, different perspectives up there in the pulpit. Um, our preaching here is lectionary based. So um, the comment that I make to every single priest who comes on staff is, I don't want politics in the pulpit. I want Jesus. Is that clear? And they all say, yes, Edward. Yes, Father Edward. Um, but, you know, so it's it's lectionary based so that, um, you know, the, the priests are also kept uh, moving through scripture, you know, at some Baptist churches and uh, non-denominational churches, they'll pick like a gospel and they'll preach on that for a month, right? In the Episcopal church, we realize that type of series presentation more in adult formation. So we're balanced. In when you get to worship, you have liturgy of the word with the sermon, then you have the sacrament, um, but you add on, you think about adding on in there um, the, your your adult formation and what you get out of that, or your weekly Bible study and how you um, get more into scripture um, and fellowship as well. It's also a place, I mean, preaching here, I don't try and have uh, sermons that don't allow you to fight back, right? So there are some moments, uh, like if you're talking about a moral question, uh, abortion, um, capital punishment, um, some sort of political issue, that would be where I would want that in adult formation, where you all can express your views and stand up to the priest, um, because that's not necessarily their expertise. There might be some of you all, like <clears throat> those of you who have worked in um, international helping the poor initiatives, right? Um, priests might not know as much as you about that. Um, prayer, I think priests... Bet they better know a lot about prayer, right? Um, and then I encourage all of the priests to, to really preach about their special areas of intention. So when it comes to Father Steve and Father Nicholas, preach about formation. Make sure you have some good, good resources and meat in there about how to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Uh, Mother Marcella right now, pastoral care, you know, include in your sermon something about how we love and care for one another. Um, and for me and for Amy, mission and vision of the church. Amy can preach just about whatever she wants because she's the, the newest priest on staff. Um, but for me, you know, usually the sermon, sometimes pastoral care, but really how is the church moving in mission and vision? Um, of course, the Holy Spirit, um, prayer life of the priest, and the scripture that's in front of them is really what guides those sermons. Um, worship can also be a way that we invite people into the church. Um, some people are intimidated um, to walk inside of a church on Sunday. Um, so we try and meet them where they are, and that's where we have Evensong. No Eucharist, no sermon. Uh, the emphasis is on music and self-reflection. Uh, we have the outside services, um, so you don't even have to go into the four corners of a church. It can be very intimidating. You can have uh, your dog out on the front lawn. Um, and then there are opportunities to engage more deeply in worship. Think about the family oblationers. Um, so they bring up the bread and the wine as part of the offertory. Think of the lectors, the acolytes. Um, think about, um, I put a picture up, uh, you can't really see so well, but this is a youth lector. So how can we incorporate all age groups into, uh, into worship? Um, wow, that, what time is it? Okay. That's all I had to say about worship, music. You all have any questions for me? Worship and music. Did I miss anything, Marcella and Amy? In, 
how to clear paper jams in the Rizzo. So Trinity is, in addition to all things you see, it's also a, a printing company. Um, so we have uh, three different copiers. One is a high-speed copier to crank out all of those bulletins on a Sunday. Um, the process that happens is, um, well, we know we have the lectionary. Um, so it's a three-year cycle that's in the back of the prayer book. If you're ever wondering where that comes from, open up the back and you'll see a lot of little dates and small print. Um, we use that. And then there is a computer software program that we pay for um, that... Uh, Trip puts in the music on Sunday that he wants. Then Amy uh, looks at that, downloads it, formats it, puts it into a bulletin. Um, that bulletin then shows up on my desk like Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning. Um, as part of that, though, how do you get the announcements in? So the announcements are shared among the staff the Thursday, a week and a half before you see them. So they're shared. All the staff members put in all their announcements on Thursday, Friday, Monday. On Tuesday at staff meeting, all of those announcements are in the staff meeting. We go through them all. Which ones are good? Which ones are bad? Which ones have we missed? How do we change them around to keep your interest? Um, and then those are uh, changed. And then those show up on my desk too Wednesday. Um, then hopefully, if everything goes well, we have a bulletin printing on Thursday morning. Um, you can see even then, as prayer requests come in, or as people um, die, or we need other prayers, those are added to uh, what you see the uh, petitioners or the prayer leaders are reading. So sometimes when the bulletin doesn't match what you're looking at, it's because the priest has gone in there and written something in. Those of you who are uh, chalice bearers and have to read prayers to people know that I try not to use my handwriting um, and let you write it yourself so you can actually read that name. Um, the prayer list, um, and because that's a part of the, the, the worship bulletin too, so that is curated by Mother Marcella who curates the intercessory prayer list. As I've said in oral announcements, it is uh, really long right now. Is it about 90? About 90 people we're praying for each Sunday. Um, so that um, list is uh, updated um, Tuesday afternoon at the clergy pastoral care meeting. All of those names are then put into the bulletin. Um, and remember, we divide up all of the names among all the different services, because if I had you all go through 90 names, um, that prayer experience, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to focus on on actually thinking and praying for those names. Um, and then I think that's it. All the lectors and, the you know, uh, uh, child spares, the uh, altar guild, the. Um, greeters, all of that list is curated by Tom, who then puts those into the bulletin every Monday. Oh, hold on. That's right. It's a very common, uh, common crit criticism would be the nice way of putting it. We've been zapped a couple of times by people um, because they say, my name isn't on there. Um, and rightfully so. I mean, they're worried. They, they want that name on there. And so we have to say, no, if you look at the whole prayer list, the name is on there. And, you know, it's just divided up among the services. And then some people will ask, can I please get that name at my service? And we do try our best. Um, but know that we're not perfect. And so there are typos in the bulletin. Some things aren't kind of formatted right. Although I will say, Amy, is doing a spectacular job right now on the formatting of everything. I have very few things I have to do in my life now. Catherine Morgan. Right, birthdays, and that's another thing that Tom does. So he runs a list from our database uh, and puts those in as part of the bulletin uh, roundup. And remember that if your birthday or anniversary isn't on there, it's not my fault. It's because you haven't updated your profile with the staff. So you can call and give us, make sure you have your birthday, your wedding, your baptism, your confirmation, that will all be in there. A database is very easily characterized as garbage in, garbage out. So yes, Linda Benny. 
Yeah, it, it, it is. But, you know, again, the, the, the piece of it is, and I try and share this with the associates, is that in every typo, in every bulletin, you know, where it's not fully justified, um, that, is, that small detail becomes a distraction for you all when you worship. Um, and so there is a very great care given to what you experience when you come to love God, right? That's, that's how big of a deal it is. You all are coming here to love and worship your Lord and Savior. Um, and we on the staff take that as a big, big burden to carry and make sure you all do well. Martins, yes. Sure. The, the question is, how do we, thank you, Tripp. I think you're done. Um, the, the question is the prayer list. How does that work? Um, is there, uh, are there different layers to the prayer list, like confidential, uh, not confidential? Um, the answer is yes. So there are all sorts of different layers from someone who says, Edward, I want you to pray for me, but I don't want anyone to know about it. And that's just on my desk to um, I want uh, or I would love all the clergy to pray for me. And that's on a, a bottom part of the Excel spreadsheet that keeps all of the names uh, there. And then there is uh, everybody else who says, no, I want my name prayed for orally in church. Um, so what we do is the way that spreadsheet is set up is we have a first name column, a second name column, um, a uh what is the petition for? Uh, anxiety, child abuse, cancer, um, mourning, um, just about everything you can think of is prayed for at this church. Uh, the next one is who is the petitioner? Who is the person who asked for the prayer? Um, and that's important because every Tuesday and in between, we, we look at it and we say, do we need to follow up with Debbie? because we know David has been on the prayer list. And so is it appropriate for us to contact Debbie and see how is she doing? What's going on? Um, is it time to go on? Do we need to stay on a little bit longer? Um, those of you who have been or had people on the prayer list, you know, you get an email from me or you get a call from one of the clergy. I mean, we, we try and uh, reach out to you usually by email because, um, you know, I think that gives people a little bit more time to think about it. They don't feel rushed. Um, and then um, I'm never, I'm never going to say, and this is where the rector sets the tone again. I'm never going to say we're not going to pray for you, right? I mean, that's not something that's going to happen. Um, we'll get some prayer requests, you know. So there are some people who have been on the prayer list for 14 years plus. Um, now, what's interesting is there's theology behind that, which some uh, priests would say, well, if the prayer hadn't worked by now, let's be done with it. I'm really not that kind of priest. Um, and so, uh, you know, just like our faith journeys, our prayer lives, you know, time has a whole lot to do with it. Um, and the the illustration I have for you all is uh, from my grandmother. So my grandmother and uh, my aunt um, didn't get along very well for a long time. Um, and, you know, my grandmother loved the Episcopal Church, loved healing prayer. So she sort of stopped going to the Sunday service and she would go to the Thursday uh, uh, healing prayer. Um, but she kept praying for that relationship. And this would have been over, wow, as long as I can remember. Um, and probably, you know, after my uncle and an aunt retired, um, moved back to New Orleans, you know, that relationship got better. Um, and Mimi really rejoiced in that. But she kept praying and praying for years and years and years. So who am I to say I'm cutting you off on time? Um, you know, we'll see what the Holy Spirit does that does with that. But that is where I will reach out <laughs> and say, and we've been praying for so-and-so for now two years. How's that going? Um, but then again, the, another, another um, experience that I had just today, we've had someone on the prayer list for a long time. I asked the parishioner, how's that going? Because... I thought it was nearing death. Um, the cancer, it was I think colon cancer has gotten, uh, you know, has abated. Now they have the bag for the rest of his life, but, you know, prayer, prayer works. 
Um, so that's the prayer list. I'm sorry. I could talk about the prayer list a while. Barbara. Barbara's, Barbara's, yeah. Barbara is sharing how the power of prayer uh, was in her life when she uh, had a, a neck injury, really, back and neck. And she was in uh, ICU intensive care for a long time. She even had a dream about a bear chasing her that involves me, but I'm not going to share that. No, no, we'll talk about that another time. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, next week, wait, yes, Robbie. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so don't forget, uh, next week, you all, Adult Forum moves on. So we thought, of, well, Father Nicholas thought it would be really neat for you all to get this behind the scenes um, uh, view of the church. And a lot of this is the stuff that takes my uh, day in, day out time, the, all the admin work. Um, but I delight in it. And you're always invited for a cup of coffee. Um, I hope that you saw the thoughtful and deliberate ways that the staff are working with the vision statement of the church, um, provided several touch points um, to take into account uh, the diversity of faith journeys here, and most importantly, um, how we're all working as clergy and staff to equip you uh, for your worship and for your ministry. Um, that's our goal, right? It's not just to put on a fun Sunday show. It's about you all, your faith journeys, and how you're growing. So uh, keep on growing and come do uh, John Hushin or get into that faith-seeking journey next week. All right? Go get them, everybody. <laughs>